Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson, and we have Tammy Kern on the podcast here. I mean, you've probably seen her on Instagram. She has, like, what, over 100,000 followers, and she just, like, the first time I honestly saw her page, my jaw basically dropped because I was like, wait, what? That's I've had a lot of older guests on, but, like, nothing like her, everyone. So this is this is an honor to have her on and, you know, to share her fitness journey, and we're trying to get a few secrets out of her. We'll see if she'll blabber or not and just be like, okay, you need, have some tips and tricks or whatever like that, but... Most importantly, Tammy, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for inviting me, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Well, I normally ask about the weather, but as I've told you before, after about the last few months, I just said, no, we're not even going to ask about the weather. So, And plus, you know, most of the time the guest just depresses me and then I don't even want to talk anymore. So to get things started, Tammy, why don't you just give us your backstory on what inspired and motivated you to get in shape and where it's led to you right now? Well, you know, I've been I've been lifting weights, training with weights on and off pretty, pretty consistently, though, since high school. And um, you were talking a little bit about your high school experience of you kind of lifting in the gym with the guys. And so this was back in the late 70s when I was in high school. And uh, it was pretty unheard of for women to be lifting weights or girls. Uh, we got a universal machine in our gym and um I tried the leg press and I blew all the guys out of the water and I thought, this is something I'm good at. <laughs> so I kind of picked up weights after that and uh, lifted uh, pretty you know, consistently. Um, <clears throat> I had children relatively young. Uh, my, my son was born with muscular dystrophy and that also motivated me to keep working out with weights because I had to carry him. He only walked from the time he was three to five and then he was in a wheelchair. And so I knew I had to be strong enough to carry him and even lift his wheelchair. Um, and uh, so that, of course, motivated me to continue lifting weights. Um, he tragically passed in 1990, but I continued uh, lifting weights because I figured there would always be a time in my life or someone's life that I would need to be strong enough to carry the load, right, literally or figuratively. Um, and it just makes me feel good. Um, and as I get older, it makes me feel even better to be able still, you know, to do what I did in my 30s. It's kind of my story. My dad still tells me to this day, you don't know how lucky you are that you didn't have to deal with the Nautilus or any of that stuff back in the day. He says, you guys have it so easy compared to what it was. Because my dad's right around your age, too. I mean, he graduated high school, I think, like 78 or something. So he's right. he's right around that age where, yeah, he tells me to this day, he'll see me working out sometimes because I, I still... I use my parents' place a lot of times to work out. I don't live with them, but I live like re super close by. But mm -hmm. I, so I come into that day and he'll, he'll watch me work out and he'll just be like, you don't realize how lucky you guys have it with all the stuff that we got. So, cause we just have, we have a, just a simple setup down there. So yeah, well, I, I was going to ask you, so like, how has this whole culture changed from when you started back in the seventies to now? Because this culture changes so much yearly, but just from that vast time period, it must've just been enormous to see the changes. Oh, a absolutely. I, you know, uh, especially in terms of women and lifting, um, it is so inspiring right now to see young women lifting and inspiring others, each other. I mean, it is part of their culture now to train with weights. Um, and as I said, when I was in high school, it was really unheard of. I was kind of the freak, you know, uh, and women my age and growing up in the eighties, uh, and probably those who competed in the eighties also knew it was just, it was sort of a, an oddity. Um, and now it's really become a sport of its own for women. And, um, I'm, I'm just so happy to see that. A and it has evolved so that I continue to learn something new almost every day. Uh, and especially now with Instagram, right? It's just so nice to have that exposure to a variety of workouts, a variety of ages, um, you know, sexes, uh, people doing their workouts, and you can you can kind of pick and choose the kinds of things that you'd like to try out and what works for you. So it's it's wonderful. It's always new, and I love that. Well, speaking of Instagram, what was that like when you first realized that like I'm actually getting a lot of traction here, and like a lot of people <laughs> are following me? What was that like, and how has that evolved? It was amazing uh my husband my husband uh puts together all the reels and does all of course all the camera work and so he's he's really um i think much more sort of in tune with with you know uh what's going on in, with instagram um but he said in november we had something like 100 followers 115 followers um and it just blew up uh, after that, you know, from November to I think January, we were up in the tens, tens of thousands, and it's just it's just continued. So, so to me, it's just it's amazing. Uh, it's 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 just a lot of fun. 
I feel super fortunate because I see people on Instagram who have fabulous content. I mean, just fabulous. And, and they're having a little difficult time, you know, with traction and, and, and picking up the followers. And I don't think it, it has anything to do with their site at all. It's just kind of, I think, um, you know, you do your best and then a lot of luck and good fortune. Absolutely. I've had, you know, a handful of videos really take off and get into like the hundreds of thousands till I got one that's a million. And it's, yeah, it's just all about luck of the draw, really, because I've had some where I'm like, oh, this is going to be huge. And then it's like right. nothing. And that's that's what like with probably every post that you do, too, where you're like, oh, this might get a lot of traction. Then like five of them don't. And then you have one that just skyrockets and you're like, <laughs> the, and the funny thing is, it's normally the ones that you don't plan on being the huge ones, too, that you're like, OK, I guess people enjoy that, I guess. So, yeah, it's it's a lot of trial and error. And that's and that's awesome. And I mean. You also have a job where I think people that are teachers, that might be one of the hardest jobs to like get in shape and stay in shape just because of the hours. I have a lot of friends that are, you know, the kindergarten teachers or the elementary school and, you know, God bless them. I could never get up that early, but has it been hard for you to stay in shape with a, with a teaching job? Um, it really hasn't because I am again, fortunate. I feel fortunate in a variety of ways, but I'm fortunate that I teach college. And so I have much more flexibility in terms of my own schedule. Um, and much more time away from campus that I can devote to uh, training. Of course, I also have work to do, you know, planning and grading and things like that, especially since I teach English. But there is still more flexibility. You know, there were times that my husband and I were up at 3.30 in the morning at the gym at 4 so I could get to campus at 7 for a class. So, um, you know, you. Uh, but I do have the luxury, I think, of – um, having more time available, even having a full time career. Um, and but you're right. Teaching is very difficult, especially for elementary. My sister is an elementary school teacher. My brother in law and my brother are both high school teachers. And um, I think that that is a really tough gig. It is. It is tough. They, they, they don't get paid enough. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to start a podcast with a couple of my friends where like I black out their faces and their voices and they would just share their worst horror stories from teaching. And then I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's the, first of all, that's like the greatest thing. I, I, but people have already done that. But so yeah, that, that is great. And please tell me like the first day of class you go in their sleeveless and you're like, okay, let's just, let's just get this over with. You just flex one thing. You're like, okay, we're done. No, no more talking about this. Let's just get this out of the way. I know that I'm abnormally, I look abnormal for someone who's an English professor. How do you deal with that? Because I get, I, Let's be honest, it's human nature that it could be distracting for a lot of people. You know, I, I just, I guess I don't perceive myself the way others see me. Um, and so I, um, I, I don't, I don't bring it up directly at all. Although lots of my examples always have to do with the gym, right? So when I talk about, you know, putting your effort and, you know, what you put into the class is what you'll get out of it. Just the same as when you go to the gym, you know, so Lots of gym analogies and lifting weight and diet and stuff like that. So they obviously know that I do that. Um, students will, though, when they feel a little more comfortable after a couple of classes, because I, I think initially they might be a little scared. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they'll come up and ask for workout secrets and diet tips and, you know, if they're doing a move correctly. So um, it's kind of it's, it's kind of like an, uns, you know, unspoken subject that I'm, I'm happy to discuss, but I don't bring up as a topic myself. Yeah, no. And that's, that's great. I would honestly be the first kid after your first lecture, I was supposed to be like, yeah, that's great. And all, but what are you doing in the gym? Basically <laughs> that, 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 that would be me. You know, I, unfortunately, I don't know if it's going to happen, but you might have some people that literally just join your class just for the gym advice, but Hey, it helps with the enrollment. So, you know, exactly. There is a point there. So, I mean, there's a point being made, but I mean, out of your entire journey that you've had through this, this is so much more of a mental journey than it is a physical journey. And so wow. many people do not understand that. I mean, you'll get people commenting, oh my God, you know, Tammy, you look amazing, but they don't understand that physical change that, or I mean, that mental change that has happened as well. What has this journey been like for you mentally? Oh, that, you know, Ryan, that's such a good point. And obviously you've experienced it to understand that. And I know you've interviewed lots of um, competitors and bodybuilders. And so you absolutely understand that, but it is, uh, so much of, of this whole sport is, is mental. And I suppose that's true with many sports, but especially when you are competing against yourself, true, right? It's in any individual sport takes a, a, a lot of mental uh, strength <laughs> and tenacity. Um, so I think, you know, mainly it's I, really from early on, you realize that there are times that you don't want to work out. 
there are times that you, you know, convince yourself that rest is what you need or you need more carbs or whatever it is so that you can eat, you know, your treats and, and, you know, sit on the sofa. Um, but you know, you know, that's not true. Right. And so it goes beyond then just uh, being motivated. Right. As, as we all know, it's, it's just discipline. You understand that this, like anything else in your life has to just be part of your life. You know, you, you eat your meals, you stay on your diet, you go to the gym, you brush your teeth, you go to, you know, you go to sleep, you, you mow the lawn, whatever it is that you do that, you know, you just become, it becomes habitual. It becomes part of your life. And I think if you do that month after month and year after year, you know, it will become part of your life and you will miss it when you don't do it decade after decade so that when you get into your 60s, um, you feel like you're still in your 30s, right? But you understand that if you don't keep up that routine and the discipline of doing it, it will, like anything, you know, deteriorate. So to me, it really is, it is discipline in the best sense of the word. You know, I think when we hear that uh, it takes discipline, people are like, oh, you know, drudgery. No, not like that. Just like making it a part of your routine. A lot of people assume that this is like a military life, basically, where it's like, oh, you wake up at this exact time, you do this exact thing, but it doesn't have to be like that. But speaking of just the mental toughness that you develop from this lifestyle, how has that impacted other areas of your life? Because I know so many people that they're able to take that and use it to benefit themselves, not just in the weight room, but in other areas. Yeah, you know, I think one good um, example is is through the recent pandemic, right? Um, I think I think that took a toll on all of us and, you know, emotional, mental, physical and, um, you know, for me, it meant converting my classes to online classes, right? Going from face to face to the online environment almost overnight. And of course, that was true of all teachers. But I think that what we all really had to dig in to that, you know, mental tenacity and discipline and just understanding that our students still need us, <laughs> Right. And they, that may be the only connection they had in their lives during the pandemic was a teacher on the other you know, side of the screen. And so, you know, we did our best. But to, you know, just to have the fortitude to do that. And of course, it wasn't just me. It's all <laughs> teachers everywhere who had to do that. Um, it, but it did help me. It made it a little easier because I've been through tough times and. And I've, I've forced myself to do things that I didn't think I could do, that I didn't think I was strong enough to do. So I knew I could do it, even if it was tough. I just want to say this. Can you imagine a person as, as talkative as me? How did I deal with being isolated from other people? It got to a point where I was almost just going to sit in a corner and just start talking to myself, basically. So th without this podcast, yeah, I would have gone absolutely crazy. So yeah, the pen, I mean, it's it's hard to think that we went through something like that just so recently, and it's kind of... I don't think about it much except when I talk on this podcast, but it's, it's just so weird that like, well, I'll have a story to tell my grandkids eventually of like, there was a time where that, where that whole thing happened. So it, it's just yeah, like a bad dream, right? Yeah. It, like most of us, I think it's sort of a bad dream. We, we really don't want to think about it because it was alarming, bizarre, um, and just really surprising that we all were able to get through that. I don't have many teachers on. So I was, so I got to ask this. So like, how do you think that that affected the students that you've had? pre-pandemic to post-pandemic how has that affected them because I've dealt I've talked to a lot of people who said like the young people it might have effects that have last that last forever for them it will I mean I think I think it's it's impacted a whole generation and and we have to be aware of that um, at all levels now um, and particularly well I shouldn't say particularly but for me particularly in college we have to understand that the next generation of students have been impacted by that experience even if the last four or five or six years of their education, you know, before they get to us is in the face-to-face -face classroom. Um, so I think that it, well, what I see right now on this immediate other side of it is that students have a very difficult time socializing with each other. Um, it, it's a skill I think that has to be retaught. And um, I think they want to, and in small groups, they, they, they do a little better, but I think that we really need to be cognizant of that. It's not that students are just on their phones and with their, you know, head ear pods on and don't want to socialize. I think it was, I think there was a huge impact. Um, the pandemic impacted them and they, and again, that, you know, we can, that is a skill like anything that can be retaught. Yeah. I mean, 
anyone, come talk to me. I can give you all the advice and how to talk. I mean, I have more words than you could ever think. Like, I, I love when I try to get guests to come on and they say like, oh, I'm really shy. And it's like, trust me, I'm so talkative that I could fill in for the both of us. So don't, you can just sit there and nod your head all the time if you want to. And I can just, I can just blabble on for 45 minutes for you. But a question that I love to ask guests is, I mean, genetics are tricky and they are unfair at times. I always tell people you can work out just like someone. You can eat just like them. You can do the same supplements. You can do anything that they do and you still won't look just like them. Me and Jay Cutler, I could do everything he does. Every, I could do, I could train as long as he would. I just won't look like him. But on top of that, everyone always has that one body part that they just don't even have to train at all when it gets started. They just, it just, they just look at it and it grows. And everyone has that one body part that just drags behind. What was one body part when you were getting started that really took off for you? And what's been one body part that you've just dragged behind? Um, I think that uh, back and biceps for me uh, and shoulders, right? So really upper body, but, but back first and then biceps and shoulders. Um, I, I, honestly, I really do, hardly have to work out and, and there's muscle there. It's because I carry less body fat on my upper body. Um, and then so then conversely, you know, quads and hamstrings, especially hamstrings, anything in the back of my lower body is my weakness. And I really have to work hard on them. Um, in fact, you know, I'm, that's my fear is because I, this will be my first competition. I've never gotten up on stage in a bathing suit and been judged because that's like, you know, crazy. Um, it is but, weird when you really think about it deep down. Like, honestly, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but that is that is where um, I, I, I feel that, that I will be dinged um, because it is those are big muscles and they and there's a lot of muscle under there, but there's still a lot of fat that covers it. And, you know, it just uh, there it's hard to get that definition. And I just don't know. Like you said, genetics. I don't know how some of these women get those beautiful cuts in their quads. I, I would love to have that. Well, I think there should just be a sign behind you saying she's 60, lay off a little, lay off a little bit. Good God. She's not like, she's not like 30. Okay, everyone. But yeah, I know it's, it's just with this whole sport, I've come to just learn how minuscule things can be with someone's body that can really just dock points or do it. Like everything has to be so proportioned and so in shape. Cause trust me, when I first worked out, I was that average gym bro where I just trained arms and upper body all day. I ran a little bit, but being a pitcher, like we always did leg exercises, but that's why for me, my back, I've always said I could gain 200 pounds of fat right now. Like just click again, please don't happen. God, like, please fingers crossed. Don't, don't, <laughs> I'm just saying that I'm not saying it, but like I could gain 200 pounds and I would still have a, an incredibly like in shape back, but my legs for me too. I mean, I got those, I got those chicken legs. Like my uncle used to call me, my middle name was Stuart, but he called me Stuart little, like the chicken basically, or Stuart little, like the mouse. Cause I had like little skinny mouse legs. He'd say so. <laughs> don't even don't even get me started on that. Calves are the number yeah. one genetic body part of all time. I don't care what anyone says. I could I could do a thousand calf raises a day. Nothing's ever gonna happen. So all right, everyone. I've already I've mentioned that on almost every podcast that I hate calves. And then literally after this, I will get messages from people sending me their calves, and then it just pisses me off. <laughs> but I did have one hilarious guy send me like cow calves, basically it's like the cows that are calves, and I was like, Okay, you deserve you deserve a, a thumbs up for that one. That was great. That's right. It's, so, you know. You know, Punnery is the best form of yep, humor, right? Yep, absolutely. So, <laughs> so what eventually changed your mind to decide to step on stage? Um, I kind of a bucket list thing. I think really more than anything, I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, I probably should do it soon. Um, and I also, my husband and I are, are going to, we're entering the same competition in July, um, both of us for the first time. And so it was, it was a goal that we um, had that allowed us to really do some transformation that we haven't been able to accomplish in the last 10 years that we've been working out together. I mean, he's just like the best workout partner and, and, and diet partner. And we've, tried, we've tried everything. So we hired a, a coach, um, Kyle Pinella. I have to give him a plug. He's just amazing. Um, but we hired him in September and um, decided that we would do this contest um, and and it, it really has been transformation. I've dropped 30 pounds since September. Um, and I probably have another 10 or 12 to go. And it's not all about pounds for sure. I've gained muscle, a lot of muscle as well, but there's been quite a transformation. And, you know, my husband and I were talking about this, you know, I've been working out for over 40 years and he's been working out about the same time. And he was in the army and all that training. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of thought we knew it all, <laughs> right. No one can really teach me anything. Yeah, yeah, I know that diet advice and blah, blah. 
So we be, have become pretty arrogant, I think, um, as many, you know, old timers will. And I'll tell you, we certainly, we learn something new every day with our coach. And um, he has just been a godsend. So I would really um, urge anyone who can to, to hire a coach, especially for nutrition, um, but also for workouts. Well, first of all, I got to say, tell your husband, I said, thank him for his service because I mean, those guys being a history major, those guys always make me feel two feet tall, just even talking to them or just even being in a room with them. So thank him for that. That is, that is great. But what was probably the biggest thing that your coach taught you that you didn't think you need or that you didn't know before, like was just eye opening you know for you? He, did. He, he, he actually fixed my metabolism. Okay. I had been, I, you know, I, I've been dieting since I was like 10, right? Um, and you talked about, you know, body parts, you know, my legs have always been heavy since I was a little girl. So it's always been, you know, on my, it's something I've, I've dealt with anyway. So I've done all sorts of crazy diets and, and, and good diets. And I had been doing intermittent fasting for the last probably four or five years <clears throat> prior to hiring my coach. And, you know, he, he asked me, you know, to show him what I ate for a week. And so I tracked that and showed him and he could not believe that I was eating under a thousand calories and not losing weight. And, um, and he, he thought for sure that I was not logging everything, but what he, what we both found out was that my metabolism had pretty much come to a stop. And so he got me eating breakfast, which I have not eaten since probably I was a child, um, and eating, um, regular meals, protein as high as I've always had it, but adding carbs, which I, I, you know, had completely given up carbs, kind of a keto I had done all those things. But anyway, so he, after just a couple of weeks, he'd gotten my metabolism regulated. So I was actually able to eat over 2000 calories and lose weight. Cause I, as I said, I lost 30 pounds. Um, and that was eating far more calories, double the calories I'd been eating. So that was, was probably one of the most important things that he, that he taught me. So we are dealing with a straight up psychopath, everyone. She didn't eat breakfast for how long? How did you, how did you do that? First of all, that's out of anything that you could tell me, that is the most impressive thing that I've ever heard on this podcast that you didn't eat breakfast for that long. So just, you just, you just waited until like lunchtime or how did you cope with that? You know, I, I think, well, for one thing, I used to smoke, right? Oh, okay. So, so my breakfast was like cigarettes. I remember someone asked. That's the breakfast someone, of champions, everyone. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> <laughs> so I smoked for years. I gave that up. Thank goodness. Um, but, you know, I would have coffee. Uh, and I, and that was the other thing I was, I was uh, drinking coffee. Uh, I would go to bed with a cup of coffee. And so I was like, you know, caffeine um, addicted for sure. Um Anyway, I, I just got used to not eating breakfast. I, I couldn't work out. I, I used to run marathons. I couldn't, I couldn't have anything in my stomach, uh, you know, when I ran marathons either. But it was adrenal fatigue, you know, and so um, all of that caffeine and, and um, you know, uh, fat burners and all sorts of things that I used to s sort of stimulate myself rather than food really caused adrenal fatigue. And, and as, as I said, my, my coach has, has gotten me back to where I'm a normal person. <laughs> I mean, those marathon runners, I have a friend that does it and they, to me are just insanity personified, but the good kind of insanity because like I more props to them for being able to do that. How long were you a marathon runner? I only ran uh, four marathons and this was in the late nineties, early two thousands um, before I injured a hamstring and, and then realized also that I probably don't have the body <laughs> structure for marathons probably it's more something you should do like, one now that'd be hilarious to see someone that looks like you just running down the, <laughs> running down the <laughs> i know clomp, clomp, clomp. <laughs> but yeah marathon runners again i have the highest respect for them but again i always told my friends i want to bring a sign at the end of one of those races a sign that just says you didn't have to do this and just have it <laughs> Just, just have it just pointed up for him because like, again, I love, I go on walks. I go on like three to five mile walks some days during the summer. Cause I live next to a nature park, but like, I could not imagine, you know, 20, the longest walk I think I ever did was like 15 miles. And that was because I just had to clear my head from something. And then, you know, my feet were all blistered up and everything. So like, again, more props to anyone that does that, but just with everything, like we talked about, you've been doing this for 40 years, all the changes that you've seen, everything that you've done how has the culture just in the gym been different? Because I can imagine the gym culture, like in the eighties is just completely different from where it's at right now. Yeah. Yeah. In the eighties. Uh, yeah. In the eighties, uh, women were yeah. not banned of course, from the, 
from the big boys room, but that's kind of how it was. You, know, you would doctor- find them on the treadmill a lot. And that still happened, unfortunately, in college where it was the treadmill was up top. The gym was down below. Yeah. 10% of the women would be down in the gym, the other 90%, and then 90% and then 90% of the guys would be in the gym and 10% would be on the tra- treadmill. Basically. Exactly. And the same with classes, right? Like, Lots of classes. This is when Jane Fonda really uh, popularized aerobics, step aerobics. And I did a lot of that, too, during those times and felt really comfortable there because, it's you know, it was all the women. Uh, and when I ventured into the weight room, um, actually, a, a friend of mine who competed at that time uh, invited me into the weight room. And she trained me initially, which was just also a blessing to have met her because she focused so much on form. And I have been a just a very conscientious of form ever since working out with her those those few years initially but we were the only women in in the weight room um and you know and we got what many women get at this time is oh you know you don't want to do that because you're going to get too bulky and you know you're going to look like a man and <clears throat> all those other things that, that that people hear that are of course nonsense so Trust me, if I think anyone did this and then they woke up the next day looking like a man, they would immediately stop doing it. That's what I think. It's like, what What do you think is – so that has always been the funny excuse to me. And it's always like, well, what kind of men are you hanging out with then if you think that that's what's going to turn them into men? Because like, I, that's – hey, you know, that is fascinating to me. But the one aspect about the sport that I would have never guessed is the hardest thing for so many competitors is posing. A lot of them, it's harder than your – see, we get that reaction every single time. It's harder than your nutrition. It's harder than the working out for a vast majority. And since you're coming up to your first show, how have you been dealing with posing? Oh my goodness, Ryan. <laughs> it is so hard. Yeah. Oh, we, we, we hired a, a posing coach. My, our, our training coach recommended this uh, posing coach who's, who's very good. Um, and, and she has been working with us novices very patiently, my husband and I, um, and, and we, and we, you know, we practice, uh, then, you know, by ourselves, uh, we are supposed to be practicing every night and we don't quite do that, but we do practice. It is so difficult because because there's so much that goes into one pose, you know, you're going from your toes all the way up to your shoulders and every single muscle you've got to concentrate on and keep flexed at the same time, which is, and breathe. <laughs> I mean, so many people think, look- absolutely. So many people think like a front double by is just like the arms and the upper body. It's like, no, your legs got to be flexed. You got to get your calves even flexed. You got to be flexing your stomach. I mean, that to me is the biggest eye opener when I finally started learning that. Cause I was just, the, like I said, the novice person who's just like, Oh, just do that. Just do this. And then just do that. Yeah. It's like, no, it's, there's so much more to it. That's what I, I thought the same thing. I was, I was, I, that has been the biggest surprise to me. I think the other things I kind of knew posing, I hadn't a clue. And you know, then now we're going to have to put that all together in a routine, which is going to be a whole other <laughs> venture. So, um, yeah, you know, wish us luck. Wish us luck. Absolutely. So out of your poses, was your favorite pose and was your least favorite pose? My, my least favorite pose is, once again, that backside, right? Anything where I have to turn my backside to the to the audience. So it's the it's the back double by um, least favorite. Um, my probably my most favorite that I think that I look best doing is the is the chest, yeah. right? It's the side chest. It's just such a pretty pose. I do like, you know, a front double by. Um, I think that looks nice too. The, the only thing I was also surprised about, though, is that I'll be competing um, in the in the um, figure yeah. physique. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's over here, not figure physique. physique. I mean, I mean, that is something that you might want to clarify before you get started on a prep. Is what exactly we're doing? <laughs> because the poses are different, right? Oh my God, yeah. I know what it is, but physique just slipped my mind. No, but I'll be posing. I'll be I'll be competing in physique. And it's different from bodybuilding, which is the only poses I ever watched, right? And so it's much more feminine. Um, and I think just open-handed, right, and, and legs crossed, which um, there's a whole balancing act that goes to that, too. So um, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a learning process. Well, at least thank God you don't have to wear those heels then if you're, because you're not doing figure then. because That's right. Again, more props to anyone that does that because just as dieted down as you get to walk on that stage in heels, more power to you. Yep. I, I agree. I could just see I, – I would be the one that would just fall flat on my face on with those heels. I'm tripping right over my own two feet. Well, plus, like I would be like 6'8", basically, in those heels. So, you know, it would, just, <laughs> it, would just, it would just be way too – they'd be like, what is going on here? Is that Shaq there or something like that? So, yeah, that would not, that would not be a good thing. But you, we talked a little bit about nutrition before. And, 
obviously, again, I'm going to have to go back to the fact that you've been training for so long. And if I look at the diet trends in the eighties compared to the diet trends now, I mean, so much has changed. I still remember like Jenny Craig when I was growing up in the nineties and mm-hmm. all the, how have you seen just the diet trends and the weight loss trends been changing over the years? Well, especially just this past few years, I've just, I've noticed kind of like my coach uh, did for me is that people are realizing, especially women are realizing that you need to um, have adequate uh, calories and macros, you know, in all three areas um, in order to build muscle, right? And, and, and in order to be strong. Um, in the eighties, it was, it was starvation always. It was always a starvation. And that's sort of how I learned to diet. Um, my mother dieted when we were little kids. And so she was on Weight Watchers. That was the big one in the you know sixties and seventies. And so I was kind of taught Weight Watchers style of eating, which probably is really more what's happening now. It's a balanced diet, um, but not a whole lot of, you know, processed foods for sure. Um, and you know, not a whole lot of fats and simple sugars, but you still have all of your food groups, um, and ample amount of calories and, and a slow weight loss, right? In high school, it was like, can you lose 10 pounds in three days? (laughs) Oh God. If I could go back to my high school metabolism where I could just, (laughs) I could just eat a burger every day, basically, and not even have to worry. Oh God, those those were the days, everyone, but I'm going to have to bring the C word in here. And it's not what you're thinking. Cardio. I hate it more than life itself. When it comes to cardio, I mean, I can go for walks. Like I told you before, but I've told people the only time you'll ever see me running voluntarily, you have to have a knife basically and chase me. That's, that's like the only, <laughs> that's the only way that's ever going to happen. But what is your relationship like with cardio? I like some forms of cardio. Um, I, you know, I, I love being outdoors. I, I, like I said, I used to run marathons and I say run, it was more like jog, you know, <laughs> jogged marathons. Um, and I, I like moving and I like moving outdoors. I love hiking. Um, and, you know, even walking, like you said, uh, you know, we take long, long walks, we live by the beach. We're able to walk, um, you know, again, very, very fortunate walk on the beach or on the boardwalk. Uh, I love to, you know, bike, <laughs> but, um, the cardio that I'm doing because it's just convenient is in the gym. And I don't like that cardio. I don't like the stairs. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. I, I uh, don't really like the treadmill and you know, the bike. Eh. So I, I do them, but I'm like you, you know, it's just like, boy, is this over yet? You know, it's just not, not fun. I helped a UPS driver one time over the summer when I was in college and that was lifting up to 80 pound packages up like, 20 flights of stairs at times. So yeah, that's anytime someone says stair masters, I just ugh, shake a little bit and just, Oh God, not again. So yeah, I, I, I thought I got away with it, but then I was like, uh, I still, I still honestly sometimes have nightmares where I'm still working there doing that. And there it's always, the guy always says like, here's a hundred pound box. You got like 15 flights get going. And then, and then I wake up and I'm like, Oh, thank God. Thank God. It was just a dream. I'm not, I'm not there again. So, but yeah, that I was, can imagine. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. I, I do gotta say though, the one thing that I found hilarious about this lifestyle and it's not hilarious but i just find it because is the clothing options that you have to deal with if you're a muscular woman it can be very hard at times and it's just it's just, it's funny for me because it's like it's just so like you would never think like when you're making clothes like what do we make them for like the really really in shape people because the way society is right now but like how do you find clothing options that work for you <laughs> that's such a good question <laughs> very very insightful very perceptive um I, I, it's funny. I have like my workout clothes, which are all, you know, stretchy spandex kind of stuff. And those fit perfectly. And then for work, I have dresses and they're usually knit as well. But in between trying to find jeans or any kind of pants or even blouses, um, it's, it's a real challenge. Uh, so I have, I have a very limited sort of in between work clothes, you know, career clothes and, and gym clothes. So um, I'm also happy that the culture has changed enough that uh, gym clothes are just perfectly appropriate almost anywhere. <laughs> I mean, I do think they ought to put an age limit on because I see like five year olds out there in gym clothes. You're just like, come on now, what's going on, people? But no, I I, I do like that too because like I see, yeah, I see so many. Just going to a Whole Foods, you'll see a, a dozen people in gym clothes, and it's just I am glad that that's you know been more of a thing because yeah, I can imagine like when I was super young, if you saw that, people would be like, what's wrong with that person? Like, why are they wearing? So yeah, it, it, that is a good change, obviously, to have. 
but just with all the things that you've experienced in this, you know, vast amount of time that you've had training, if someone were to walk up to you and say, you could change one thing about the health and fitness lifestyle in general, and everyone would go along with it. If you were just the, the CEO and you know, whatever you said goes, what would be the biggest thing that you'd like to see changed? Wow. What a great question. The first thing that came to mind was it, it, I would love to see it integrated more fully into everyday life. I would love to see every, um, you know, business or school have a gym so that it's just something you did at lunchtime. You had that option very easily to go to the gym and do whatever you do. Um, so just to have it, I think more available to more people, um, would be, would be really, that's what I would like to see. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I like the changes I'm seeing again, you know, uh, that, that diet has changed so much so that it, that this whole idea of starving yourself is really ludicrous. You know, people understand that that is not healthy. <laughs> that is counterproductive. Um, that's one great change. You know, another great change is that you can do a variety of exercise. You can do exercises in different ways, right? There isn't just one way to do it. Um, I, I, I like that. I love that Instagram and social media have brought workouts to everyone. So there, and there are things that you can do in your home. You don't have to go to the gym if you don't want to, or for whatever reason, can't go to the gym, you can do your workouts anywhere. So I'm happy to see it's infiltrated our society, um, our global society, truly, um, as it has as much as it has, but I would like to see it in the workplace more because it is so, so vital to well being. I honestly wish they would just give, their employees like half an hour a day and have a gym and just be like, yeah, you can go do whatever you want. And just cause yeah, it, it, it has gotten to a point now where I look at society sometimes as a whole and you're like, we really need to all take a look in the mirror and just, you know, something needs to be done because it, it just keeps getting worse and worse. And yeah, you know, but it's, it's good. It's psychologically, it's good for you. I mean, you yeah. just feel better, oh, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Relief stress. I think that a lot of, you know, uh, work, uh, workplace conflict could be eliminated if people just had an outlet, right? If you could just work it, work it out in the gym. Um, so anyway, that I would love. Oh, 100%. Like there have been times where I have gotten really angry and it's, it helps you now again you got to make sure when you're angry working out that you don't overdo it because i've had times i had one time where i did overdo it a little bit where i was like oh i can totally squat that and no you can't ryan no you can't your anger yeah you can maybe lift a little bit more than usual but yeah don't overdo it that was when i was you know 19 years old i learned the hard way of you know like yeah not so good of an idea but yeah they that helps with stress more than anything and also like a nice long walk like i sometimes take right now i mean we are getting slush right now as I'm talking to you, which I promise I wouldn't mention, but I'm just looking out my window right now and seeing it. And oh my God. Tammy, we got to change my, we got to change my mind right here. We got to, you know, get off. I'm off topic right now. Cause now I'm just going to like, if I start crying when you're talking, just know that that's, that's the reason. Just, why. Just mentally, mentally bring yourself here and, and, and the sunshine and the cool breeze. I have a beach, beach, I, have a beach I have a beach screensaver right behind you right now that I'm looking at right now. and just trying to, you know, focus on that. Perfect. But, I mean, when it comes to helping yeah. others in the gym, because I think that's a huge thing that needs to be yeah. done. I mean, you make so many instructional videos on how to do exercises and I've watched all those and they're incredible. What are some of the biggest things that you see from people getting started working out that they struggle with? Um, I think, um, I think just good form overall. I mean, that's, that's a huge generalization, but, uh, I think that, uh, women in particular, um, just kind of don't know their bodies in terms of like pulling weights, you know, and lifting and moving weight around and what is good for them in order to work, work that muscle and isolate a muscle and avoid injury. So that's, you know, that's, I think the main thing that, that women probably need to see, to hear advice on. And, and I think for men, especially young men, it's exactly what you just said. <laughs> don't lift so much. You don't need to lift the whole gym. It's not even effective. It, you, you're, you might be able to do it at 18, <laughs> but your spine is not going to thank you by the time you're, you know, 28. So, um, yeah. So th those kinds of things I think are, are the advice that I would give or that people even seek out. Like what's the, how do you do this exercise? Right. What have been some of the biggest adjustments you've had to make as you've aged in the gym? Because obviously, like you said, you're not going to be doing the same type of exercises that you were doing in your 20s and 30s that you're doing right now. 
Well, yeah, you know, actually I am doing the same exercises and even heavier, oh, wow. believe it or not. And I always, I always, I always told myself um, and others that, you know, I should be doing more weight because I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, if you are doing the same stuff that you're doing in your twenties, like the same weight, people are like, what's been the point of this entire journey then if you're just doing the same, yeah. yeah you should, you should be improving, shouldn't you? <laughs> but, but, but I, I, I have noticed it on my joints. And so, you know, for the first time in my life, this year I bought knee sleeves and I've been using knee sleeves, um, you know, for some heavy leg days. Uh, I, uh, once again, early in the eighties, it was in nineties, it was, um, popular to wear a, a weight belt. And then, you know, we pretty much the, 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 the thinking was you shouldn't be lifting so much that you need a belt. You know, you should have strong enough core. And now we're kind of back to the belt. So, and I just, I do use a belt now and then, um, I think mostly psychologically, it kind of helps me feel, you know, that my back is more secure. And the most important part of this lifestyle and any lifestyle in general, I will argue to the death with anyone in this is sleep. How do you deal with sleep? Because I struggle with it all the time. I think you can see the bags under my eyes. Those will never go away just because I don't care. I can take any, I can take any sleep aid that's imaginable. It's just for me, it's, it's a, it's a picker poison. Basically it's a hit or miss all the time, but how do you deal with sleep personally? Are you someone that sleeps easily or are you someone that struggles with it? I'm very fortunate. I, I have always slept very easily. Um, I know I'm sorry, Ryan. I let, I put my head on the pillow after I've drank a cup of coffee and I'm sound asleep after you drink a cup of coffee. Yeah. No, probably not anymore. That's what I was, I was going to say. If, you, if your head falls, what I was going to say, what is in that coffee then? If you're drinking that and falling asleep right afterwards? I mean, I was, I was, you know, I was so saturated with coffee during those years before I actually changed that, you know, that I could drink a cup of coffee and go right to sleep and stay asleep. Um, I never understood people who said, I can't drink coffee after noon, you know, but now I'm kind, I'm more sensitive that way. Nevertheless, um, yeah, I, I, I sleep very well uh, and I always have, um, you know, I could sleep, I could sleep eight to 10 hours if, if I was allowed to, <laughs> but of course we don't have that much time, right? I, I honestly, it's like, it's gotten to a point where I almost want to tell people like, just add an hour to the day. I don't care how that affects the rotation of the, or, or anything like that. Just add an extra hour. I don't care. I'll go along with it. If it starts getting dark at 1 PM eventually because of it, it's like, I'll, it happens, but you know, it's, yeah, it's, there's so right. little time in the day when you really get down to it, but that's another, another big struggle that a lot of people deal with, but you're an inspiration for a lot of people and you don't have to think that yourself, but I'm just going to say it because you are like, I've seen the comments that people make and you know, all the followers that you have, how important is that to you just to be that beacon and show people that like, Hey, you can be in shape at any age and no matter what, you know, anything's possible. It's, you know, it's, it's just, it's so kind. It's, it's a surprise to me. But it's 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 very motivating to me um, to to continue to work you know work out and post and you know you just love and it's, I guess it's a teacher in me I just I just love to help people I love to help people find their strengths and 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 you know some of the comments I get people you know have have expressed that and it's absolutely rewarding I I, I just love it. I mean, yeah, I can't imagine what that must feel like. That must just be amazing. And when we do have you on a year from now, because I'd love to talk to you again, where would you like to be at in your journey? Where would you like to be at just in your overall life? What are some goals that you'd like to have achieved? Um, well, I, w I will have, <laughs> unless I, so, so I can't chicken out. I will have completed one competition and I would like to, you know, continue. I think that I would like to use that as the benchmark, of course, you know, and, and at least for another year, I think I might have two or three years left where I could do this. Um, I, I, I would like to improve. So I would like to do the first competition and then do at least another one or two within the next year and improve. Um, whatever that means, because I don't know what will happen with that first show. Um, and also, I should say that a year from now, I will be uh, retiring from teaching. So I've taught for 32 years at the same college. Um, and next year will be my last year. And uh, I, so I'm looking forward to putting even more time into um, inspiring people in other ways with fitness. Good God, give her a medal and a monument. 32 years teaching? Jeez. 
That is, that is, yeah. hey, that's like, a, I said it before, but that might be the most impressive thing that you do on this entire, in your, in your life, 32 years as a teacher, because like I said, the horror stories that I've heard, more power to you. Again, it's college might be a little different, but that's still, that is, that is incredible. And that is just so great. And yeah, it's just been a pleasure to have you on and talk to you. I mean, I, I knew that the moment that I found out that you're a teacher, I was like, okay, she's going to be a great person to talk to because teachers, you know, they're, they're nice to talking. I've had some of those guests, like I've told you, where it's just tell me about your journey. And they're just like, Oh, I just wanted to work out. So I started lifting weights and you're just like, so it's going to be one of those, but like with, no, it was, you're, you're such a great, you're such a great guest. And it was a delight to have you on. And you know, I cannot thank you enough. And everyone go and check out her Instagram page. Prepare yourself. First of all, mentally, before you do that, like you will just be like, what's going on here. What's happening here. You would, your jaw might drop a couple of times, but you will be inspired to get off that couch and stop eating all those Twinkies. But again, Tammy, I cannot thank you enough for coming on. It was an absolute delight to talk to you. Thank you, Ryan. It was my true pleasure. Thank you very, very much. Absolutely. Well, everyone, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.